Right now, not probably, I'm sure that you know, but I don't have the topics here, it looks like. But basically, sciences are the artificials. And uh, uh, I have the real pleasure in introducing uh, Professor Partho Pratim Chatterjee. Chakravarti, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Partho Pratim Chakravarti, who is the uh, director of IIT Kharagpur at present. And I'll give a brief introduction. So his accomplishments will be very long and his credentials very strong, so I cannot cover everything in the short time of introduction. So I will just, you know, highlight some of the contributions he has, he has made in science. He's a both an active scientist right now as well as educator. And um, so I'm just very, very pleased to introduce him. Uh, he's a He's currently director, I say, that maybe, and he's also a professor of IIT. And um, he's, uh, uh, he's, he's, his expertise include, or the research areas of interest, includes artificial intelligence, formal methods, CAD for VLSI, and embedded systems, fault tolerance, and algorithmic designs. So he, he's, as a, he's, uh, uh, he has been, let me see, a lot of those things are here, but uh, he, he has been involved. He's, he, he got a lot of accolades and honors internationally and uh, nationally. And uh, he has made a lot of contributions in domestic programs as well as international programs. And important among them include DST, CSR, IGST, C program and Volkswagen Foundation, National Semiconductor Corporations, and the, pro and the projects from them, Sun Microsystems, Intel Corporations, and General Motors, Xerox, etc. There are many of them that he has been actively involved with. And uh, he's a well-known teacher and mentor who has not only graduated a large number of students and developed well-appreciated teaching modules, but has also motivated and championed many student innovations and entrepreneurial activities which have achieved unique successes. So, and uh, I just wanted to find something which I cannot find now, that he started some space, he pioneered the development of the incubation program at IIT Kharagpur. Incubation means technological, you know, uh, incubation, some kinds of facilities are provided, as I understand, for development of some ideas, you know, new ideas or something. Like that. It needs some incubations before it becomes goes commercial. I think that's what it means by incubations. Please correct me if not. And uh, so, uh, so that's uh, that's some of the you know some of the things that I could talk about him. And uh, just uh, to tell you a few things about his about the accolades and honors he received. The Dr. Chakravarti received the President of India gold medal in 85. He was an IIT graduate, so he received that gold medal. The Inside Young Scientist Award in 1991. Then Onil K. Bosch Award in 1995. INAE Young Engineers Award in 1997. And the uh, Sharna Jayanti Fellowship, 97-98. Then another quite well-known one is Shanti Sharu Patnagar Prize in 2000 as young scientist. Then INAE Rishashwaraya Chair Professorship 2007 and many other awards. He has been elected a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi, and the Indian Academy of Science, Bangalore, and the Indian National Academy of Engineering, and the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. And he's, he's a tremendous amount of you know, contributions he made in science, and very well known nationally and internationally both. So he's now an educator, but as well as an active researcher. So we'll hear something very interesting uh, things from him, I'm sure, and we'll, all of you will enjoy about listening to him. Now, uh, just before I go further, just uh, I want to you know, mention some, and, uh, something about our next program. Next program under the Vivekananda Science Cycle would be uh, a lecture by Dr. Ashok Pradhan on principle of homeopathic medicine and its applications in cancer treatment. That will be on 22nd February in this hall at 6 o'clock. And there's another announcement I'd like to make that uh, there's another talk will be there on 3rd February at this hall at 5.30 p.m. 
and that will be given by Rajiv Malhotra on Hinduism, Swami Vivekananda, and India Visa is the West, and uh, in addition to his latest book, Indra's Net. So that will be interactive sessions also. You will get a chance to ask questions. And Rajiv Malhotra is an Indian American researcher, quite well known writer, speaker, and public intellectual on current affairs as they relate to civilizations, cross-cultural encounters, religion, religion and science. So he is a, he is a physicist, physicist and scientist by training and now full-time founder director of the Infinity Foundations in Princeton, New Jersey. So he has a lot of other things also, but uh, just uh, you'll see that, you know, if you see the announcements later on you'll find all these other credentials are there. And uh, with this you know, simple introduction, I would request you know, Professor Chakravarti to come on the dais, and also you know, Swami Supernanda Ji, if you would kindly come and uh, uh, present to him some token of our, appreci for our appreciations. I think there are two books, two sets of books are there. And uh, so I'm very, really pleased to have uh, Professor Chakraborty, who is very, very busy. He came back to Kharagpur yesterday. This morning he came here again. He will go back, then come back tomorrow again. So he's just traveling all the time. So we are lucky to have him. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, Swamiji, both of them, Professor Lahiri, <coughs> all the members of the audience. First of all, it's a great honor to be here, and I've been extremely scared from the, from the day one about what am I going to say. <coughs> when I asked my spiritual mother yesterday, so she told me that first you get a set of books. And then, whatever you will talk about should not be completely of the artificial. And she did not know what I am going to talk about. So yesterday night when I went back to Kharagpur, I made some modifications on the title. Today, every person who grows up, we have, all of us here are fairly old but my children and their children who will grow up, will grow up in a peculiar world. The world of the real, the real which exists, the real which is perceivable to them, the world of their imagination. And that, if you say, is an unreal world, whether that is true or not, is something. I mean, it does. I mean, it does. Is, is also a question that we need to ask. The third is the world of information. The huge amount of information that is going to be available about the real world. And the fourth, which is of this generation, is the virtual world. The world which is completely virtual, in which they live, in which they dream, in which they work. Around these worlds, we have built for them the sciences. The natural sciences and all the sciences that we have developed, of which the most youngest child is what we call information technology and computer science. The computer science and information technology is actually not just something that grew up in 1957 or 1945. 
It is the progression of the industrial revolution when people tried automation. And what we see today is just a small face of that rapid growth of industrial automation that started from the steam engine to harnessing of energy to today what we have as the digital computer. This device, the digital computer, which has changed our lives and is changing our lives in such a way that we begin to think like them, is a peculiarly simple device. It has got three major components. One, which is a processing unit, which does some arithmetic operations. A memory where it stores whatever it does. And an input-output processing unit, all connected together. It's as simple as this. And fundamentally, if you look at it, you can make everything into a set of 10 to 12 instructions. With these 10 to 12 instructions, people are able to write what are called, and we all know are called programs, using these instructions. So this is a simple program in that language, which reads two numbers, adds them and prints them. And this set of programs, with the memory and the processing power, which can do simple arithmetic and transfer, has enabled us to write what is called software. And what software are we able to write on this using these simple 12 or to 20 instructions? We can read an integer and determine whether it is a prime number or not. We can find out whether it is a palindrome, Malayalam. You know, you can read it same from both sides. So somebody will give you a string. You say, can it be read from both sides? We can write a program for that. You can read in all the cities of this country, which have airports, and all the flight information. And if somebody asks you what is the shortest flight from this point to this point, you can determine it. So you can write a program for that. Now somebody in the country wants to do telephone placement. They want to put telephone poles so that the total wire length is minimized. How will you place telephone poles to connect a set of people in a city so that the total telephone wire length is minimized? You know, there are ways to write programs to find this solution very quickly. It does not look an obvious problem to us. You want to control the satellite that goes through in this country? You can write a program and remember all those programs eventually are written using these 20 instructions. <clears throat> you can write, you know, you read this MS Word, Word Processor, it is a program and you can read it. You can write a program for that. You write languages, compilers, the whole Windows operating system which runs this is a program. Eventually translated in those 20 instructions. The police do fingerprint recognition. That is also a program. Today, the program which is written for chess playing can beat all the grandmasters standing one after another. People thought chess was intelligence. It was the epitome of intelligence. And today, nobody tries to play with a computer with the blue jean computer. After Kasparov lost, everybody loses. Speech recognition today is becoming almost a reality. People are not, have not solved that problem, but are solving that problem to a great extent. Language recognition. I'm going to speak in a language, people are, this problem has also not been solved, but this is another problem which we can attempt. Do you know that the Fermat's theorem, four color, sorry, the four color conjecture, which was the map coloring problem, a hundred to few hundred years old problem, it was solved. It was solved by a hundred, by a thousand page proof and the proof was generated by a computer. It was not a proof written by hand. It was a proof 
generated by a computer. Today, new laws in mathematics are being discovered. New drugs are being discovered. And all of them boils down to those 20 instructions. This is the magic of computation. This is the magic of computation that makes us assume that this software or this programming has got ultimate power. But this has got fundamental limitations which people don't seem to know. Programs are so powerful that they can read another program and analyze it. So now comes the very interesting question. That is if a program can read another program and analyze it. How many people have written programs here? Those who have written programs, all of us know that you always have to debug your program. Nobody will debug it for you automatically. And there's a reason for it. That is, if you take another program and you can analyze it, and the killing argument is that can you, the, the one who analyzes it is also a program, and you take another program and analyzing it to analyze it, the killing argument is can you analyze yourself? That is, you will write a program and I will give it to you to analyze. I will give you yourself to analyze. And that is where comes the fundamental limitation. The fundamental limitation is when a program is asked about itself. The system is such that you can actually ask that question. Therefore, if you write a program and ask whether this program will stop, then can there be a program which writes it? And the answer is no. There is an elaborate proof for that. There are very simple proofs and there are elaborate proofs. Among the proofs, one of the proofs is that assume on the x-axis you have all the inputs that can be given in the world in finite inputs and on the y-axis you have all the programs that can be written in the world and the answers to these programs let us assume are yes or no so for every program p for every input whether it is yes or no that is the list so this is this infinite x by y table tells you that programs all the programs that can be written in the world now I want to ask a question about what is written below there, n, n, y, y, which is an input, which is a problem, who says that for x1 I want n, for x2 I want n, for x3 I want y, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go to details, but I just want to say that this has been constructed, but if this is y, this is n, if this is y, this is n, and so forth constructed in such a peculiar way to prove that none of these programs give this output. Which means that there is a fallacy on my assumption that this is the set of all possible programs. Which means that there is something that cannot be written. And I can, don't want to get into too nitty gritty details, but I can tell you that the number of such unsolvable problems divided the ratio of the unsolvable problems by the number of solvable problems is the same ratio as the real number set with the integer number set. Both are infinite. The real number set is all the decimal point number sets. It is the continuous set. And the integer set is also infinite, but there is a world of difference between these two infinities. One is larger than the other. So the first thing to be remembered is that while this is an extremely powerful tool, it hits on its head when it is asked questions about itself. And the number of questions that you can ask about yourself is infinitely larger than the questions that you can yourself do.
So there is a very, very fundamental limitation on this model. Notwithstanding all this, people have started and solved. We have seen its power. In addition to this, there are resource limitations because when you actually build the computer, it requires power. It requires memory. Can you use infinite memory? Can you use infinite power? No. So, problems are such that they can be solved, but they may take in large amount of time to solve. For example, if I give you two arbitrary numbers and ask you to factorize it, it's a very simple problem, but if I give you large numbers to factorize, and the best computers today will take at least three to 4,000 years to factorize that number. So there's no point solving that problem. Because by three to 4,000 years, everything will be changed. There is so problems which cannot be solved in reasonable time are also important to address. So intractable problems and tractable problems. So when you understand computers, you need to understand that some problems are easy to solve. If I give the input, the output will come. Some problems are such that if I give it to solve, the time that is required to get that output may be very, very large. So that is the other side of the story when we build something in the real world. So energy, environment, all of these are actually the most difficult problems to solve today. Reliability, energy are the most difficult problems to address when we design computers today. But there have been major conquests. In, our, in the approach that computers have taken in their strength to help humanity and to develop itself, there have been major conquests. The first is the conquest of silver. Today, if you look at this mobile phone today, its power is much more than the best computer that was there in a room larger than this room 50 years ago. Miniaturization, precision technology have enabled people to make devices. Today we have fun with this computer, we, we turn this around, everything flips. Can you imagine that, do you know the wire length of the processor in this? If you just stretch it, how far it will go? It will go to the moon. It will go to the moon. That is the level of miniaturization and that has been one of the biggest conquests. The second conquest is communication. And we have not achieved unbounded communication in wireless space. The third is the internet. Today the internet is everything for you. Your personalized post box, your library, your marketplace, you know, it's the digital repository of the universe, of all of civilization. The biggest thing is the conquest of time, parallel computation. And finally, deep, deep intelligent software. Very, very deep, very intelligent software all, all of this human being has tried to use the digital computer to mimic itself and find out where is the difference and what a human being can do and what a computer cannot do. And I shall come back to it. So artificial intelligence is that science which tries to automate various processes of reasoning and search and discover. How do a human being try to solve a problem? One is by reasoning. Can we automate reasoning? Can we automate the whole process of logic? This has been an ancient attempt both in India, Greece and Europe. The process of automation of logic. 
the second is in the vast space of possibilities can be quickly determined which one it is sometimes some people have intuition and suddenly get to that problem some people you take a lot of time so is there a systematic way in which we are able to address and find a solution to a difficult problem so two are hallmarks of artificial intelligence one the basic problem of artificial intelligence is that typically software is written by knowing that this is the problem i will write a program to solve it now i want to write a program which will take the problem statement as input you know all our geometry problems as input all our physics problems as input all our chemistry problems as input a research problem which i haven't solved if i can write the input and give it to the computer can it come up with the answer can a computer start solving problems automatically can i make a computer which will replace the sitar player whereas there is a human tabla player and they are doing jewel bandi so that is the attempt and the person with whom it is benchmarked against is always the human being because the human being is so obnoxiously ignorant that there may be other elements which are more intelligent than it but we are trying to discover can we mimic the intelligence of the human being so can we have formal methods can we look back and this is not just what artificial intelligence does today what nash has studied before what plato's axioms were there everything it is historical development newton did not discover his laws by an apple falling on his head if you look at history of science there was 1400 years of research before newton's laws of motion came into the form that we know so one is systematic search the second is learning and the third is deduction three fundamental pillars on which artificial intelligence stands is logic search or exploration can i quickly find a solution in that a step and learning from experience i train something with your speech your mobile phone will get trained and then whatever you say it will understand so can we adopt so these are the three pillars of artificial intelligence of which logic and deduction is based on our simple boolean algebra and its extension we learn this in school and get or not etc etc we just extend that for example here you will see we write all men are mortal rajat is a man prove that rajat is mortal so the rule is written this way for all x man x implies mortal x the second fact is rajat is a man rajat and i want to know whether mortal rajat and by this mechanism i really have a formal method to do this this looks a very trivial example but this is the one which was used to codify all the mathematical laws and prove that four color